Thanks. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today I'm pleased to have Abdeslam Belarius uh, talking to us about uh, robotic manipulation. Uh, Abdeslam did his uh, PhD at the University of Laval and then did a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon before coming to Rutgers. Abdeslam. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> Welcome, everyone. Uh, so we'll be talking about model identification for robust robotic manipulation. And uh, the end goal of my research is to uh, be able to, to build uh, robotic assi work assistance that can help humans in various manipulation tasks, especially in manufacturing. And to achieve this goal, we need to ma make robots that can recognize objects in clutter, manipulate them efficiently, and learn new skills. So humans obviously are very good at manipulating all sorts of objects. They, they have very high dexterity. And uh, robots, if you look into the state of the art, we, or maybe m most of the experiments that we do in robotics, they often look like this. So we are still very far from achieving that goal. Uh, so, so if you look into experiments or robotic grasping, you will always see failures going like this. And that's, because, that's due to the um, perception problems, manipulation problems, the fact that the objects may be unknown, and all sorts of issues like that. Um, so human babies, they, they, this, so grasping is a very basic skill. Uh, human babies learn how to reach uh, to object and grasp them at a very early age, uh, around four months. And this skill is not limited to humans. Uh, apes in general are known to be able to pick up tools and use them efficiently. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this illustration. It shows the body where every part is, the size of every part is proportional to the part in the brain that's dedicated to it in the motor cortex. And uh, I was surprised when, when I saw this, like the, the hands are very huge. They, they occupy a big part of the motor cortex. And that's due to the large number of sensors and, um, and uh, actuators that we have on the hand, degrees of freedom. So this just shows how important uh, manipulation is for, for the brain. So when I'm talking about uh, object manipulation, I'm talking about usually this kind of tasks where we have an object in front of the robot. The object is unknown and uh, the robot needs to pick it up, maybe hand it over and then put it somewhere. Um, so these kind of tasks that are necessary for doing uh, manufacturing jobs. Uh, we need to make a distinction now between classical industrial robots and uh, intelligent robots. So you have all seen videos of robots building cars and doing things very efficiently, but usually in those cases, uh, the objects are, sorry, the objects are completely known and everything is well defined. The position of the object is known, the models are known. So the robots just repeat the same actions again and again. Uh, the, uh, the problems that I'm interested in are cases where the environment is kind of open or so, structured or semi-structured and where we have a non object we don't know where they are in space we don't know their properties we don't know their labels so a lot of things are unknown and the robot needs to achieve to solve some uh, to, to achieve uh, some goals there and perform some tasks solution to that is uh, learning from experience so we can be using machine learning for that i'm going to start with the very first work that i did for robotic manipulation that was a while ago at max Planck institute and uh, what we are trying to do here is to teach robot to pick up objects so we we take models uh, 3, 3d models and then we label certain regions where you can grasp it and we also provide the rotation of the hand and we provide other examples where it's not good to grasp it. And then we, we use uh, computer vision techniques. So we can use neural networks or we can use Markov random field. And then you can generalize to entirely new objects, as you can see on the right side, and the robot will figure out how to grasp them. Um, when I moved to, uh, to Carnegie Mellon University, I started working on um, search, can, search and rescue operations. And I built this uh, fully autonomous system where a robot is tasked by, uh, to pick um, objects in clutter and uh, remove them move them off the way. And the object can be regular human-made objects, as you can see on the left side, or a regular and uh, natural objects, as you can see on the right side. So to my surprise, the bottleneck here, the biggest issue is just having a very good physics simulator. So if you have very good physics simulator that can check for collisions and can also verify, before executing an action, verify that the grasp is going to be stable and also be um, optimizing the grasps. Uh, such that we choose the contact point perfectly, and then we can also choose rotation uh, very well, then uh, the problem becomes uh, solvable, and we achieved very high success rate. The problem now with, the, so we developed a physics simulation for that, but the problem was that physics simulation is very slow, it takes a lot of time. So every time you try to simulate an action, it will require multiple seconds. So to solve this issue, we can be using, uh, so solution that we propose is to use neural network to clone the simulator. So instead of calling the simulator all the time, we can try to imitate it by using neural network that learns what simulator is gonna be uh, proposing. And uh, neural networks are much faster and they can, um, so they can uh, give us answers in, in much faster times. 
shorter times. So in this case, we can have as an input a pile of natural objects, and we have this neural network that we trained using the simulator, and the output will be a heat map uh, that gives us at each point the probability that grasping uh, an object at that point, uh, there is also another dimension, which is the rotation and orientation and the opening of the fingers. Um, but anyway, at each point in this map, we can get the probability that the grasp will be successful there. So then you can pick up the grasp with a high success probability and you want to execute it on the objects. Well, not so fast because you can, uh, most of the time you can never run something you get from neural network directly on physical robot. Otherwise you will may end up into collisions or making, uh, having some, some problems. So what you want to do is to fine tune the, the best grasp that you get from the neural network. You can fi fine tune it using physics simulation. And uh, so you need to perturb a little bit that grasping configuration and search for the best uh, possible grasp, which, which is not gonna be very far from the prediction of the neural network. Now, how do you do that? So each time you, uh, you want to simulate, you can pay in time, so you can spend some time. So how can you do that efficiently? This is called a black box optimization, where you have uh, a black box, in this case, it's physics simulator, and you have an input, which is in this case, grasp position and configuration, and output, which is, for example, success probability. Now, if I give you that, and then I ask you to find the best grasp, and then uh, you can maybe just try randomly different grasp positions, and then you see which one gives you the highest, and then you execute it. But it could be uh, time wasteful, so you want to do this more efficiently. And one solution that I proposed is uh, called Grady Entropy Search. So it's part of Bayesian optimization platform, where on the X dimension here, we represent the parameters of grasping. On the Y dimension, we have the grasp success probability. And then we have for different grasp configurations, we get the from simulation grasp success probability. But now, now we want to populate this, um, this uh, space such that we can pick up the maximum uh, or figure out where is the maximum, but we want to populate it efficiently. So we want to be selecting this point uh, in, uh, in, from, in an efficient way from an information point of view. So you can, uh, what you can do is you can uh, build a Gaussian process, which is nothing but the distribution on functions. And then from that Gaussian process, you can compute a uh, probability on where is the optimal action X. So X is the optimal grasp. And then from the Gaussian process, you can compute uh, a distribution on X. We're gonna call this Pmax. And the algorithm that I proposed was um, we can be selecting the action that contributes the most to the entropy. Uh, so if you compute the entropy of Pmax, it's gonna be the sum over all Xs or the integral over all Xs of uh, negative Pmax X times log Pmax X, the equation below. And we'll be selecting the action that contributes the most to this uh, entropy. And uh, this way you can reach the, the maximum uh, with as little simulations as possible. Uh, so this gives us an anytime uh, search algorithm. Well, Abdel Slam, can I yeah. ask you a question? Yes. So, so I'm kind of confused. So if you have a physical simulator giveaway which predicts the success probability given an environment, why do you need a neural network? Uh, it's for time efficiency. So the physics simulator takes a lot, a lot of time, like uh, in uh, maybe 0 0.1 seconds, but the neural network is much faster. And neural network can predict for the entire image given just an image as an input and predict, predict for an entire image where, or, or what is the success probability for each possible point. Uh, so for example, this image here, uh, that was why go, this image here, I get it from neural network, I think in, uh, for, from learned function, I can get it in a second at most, but in physics machine, it took me 200 seconds. That was like five, year, five years ago. And uh, it's much faster, it's much slower if you simulate everywhere and uh, run, do collision checking. So neural network is kind of fast heuristic, uh, just visually tests you where all the possible good grasps. It's much faster. Does this answer your, your question? Uh, so just as a follow up. So, so physics simulator is typically using some analytical model of the environment and like some uh, uh, higher dimensional model. So what neural network is typically doing is creating an abstraction on top of the uh, the analytical model that you have, just retaining some features that are required to predict probability. Is that yes, correct? Exactly, correct. So it looks, for example, where is empty space, which uh, here, for example, which rock is higher. Um, so it, it looks into features around the, uh, the object and from there it can, uh, um, it can predict what the what simulations can do. So it's an approximation of the simulation, which is not, uh, we cannot trust it 100%. Uh, we can use it as initial seed and then we can continue from there using uh, Bayesian optimization, as, as I said, but uh, it's faster, that's the advantage. 
And your reference is basically a desktop machine, standard stuff, not a supercomputer or anything. Sorry, the reference is? It's, it's a basic desktop machine. You're not talking yeah, about... Yeah, this. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you. All right, so this gives us this algorithm in a time. So, um, all right, so that was the first uh, part. And then, so what I'm trying to do is to motivate the, the work I have been doing recently, starting from uh, basically my, my journey in, in this problem. So that's why I started from a few years ago. Uh, so the next move, uh, next thing I did was, I thought that problem was a little bit too easy. So let's look into more confined environments. And that's a term that we hate these days, confinement. So let's look into objects where, that are too big to be picked directly by the robot. Like for example, this box and this pipe, you cannot grasp them directly. And we have also fixed the obstacles around them. So the, the robot needs to uh, move these objects a little bit, rearrange, manipulate the scene in a way that will make it uh, graspable. And then we can pick up the rock, the pipe, for example. Let's say, for example, we can just roll this pipe or push it to the front and then we can pick it from there. So the robot will end up doing sequence of actions that have no immediate utility uh, in order to to be able to grasp the objects at the end. So this is obviously a, uh, a reinforcement learning framework where we have a sequential decision-making problem. We have an environment, we have a robot. The robot will be executing a sequence of actions and receiving rewards and observations from the environment. And then uh, whenever, for example, it succeeds uh, to grasp an object, then it gets positive reward. Whenever it fails, it gets negative uh, reward or zero. And uh, if we have model of the environment, then we can just simulate things and then we can choose actions and then we can execute them. However, the problem I'm interested in is the case where we don't know, let's say we don't know anything about the environment where the objects are unknown. And that's what I have been doing, uh, what I will be doing later, uh, cases where the objects are completely unknown and we don't have any models for them. Uh, so the robot just looks into a scene for the first time. So in that case, we cannot use simulation or models, so we can learn directly from experience. And this is called model-free reinforcement learning. So whenever a robot does something useful, like picking up an object, it gets a positive reward, and the robot can get the, the compute that reward based on the configuration of the hands. Uh, so it can immediately tell if it succeeded to pick something or not. Whenever it does something which is uh, anything else, it gets negative reward for wasting time. And just by doing that, which is very minimum um, thing, right? You just need to define functions that computes rewards, and then you can let the robot learn on its own. And this is what I'm going to show here. So the robot here is exploring randomly all sorts of things that it can do with this scene to pick up, to clear it up. And it's trying to push, pick, uh, somehow grasp, and then push. And this is random exploration. So what we are seeing here is uh, model-free reinforcement learning on physical robot. And then eventually by chance it discovers uh, a good maneuver. And then this behavior gets reinforced uh, later. So it's still exploring now. It's not sure of what it did before, if it was the right thing or not, it was just chance. And then eventually it goes back to that and that behavior gets reinforced. So I'm gonna just skip to 60 steps. After 60 steps of learning, this uh, skill becomes uh, reinforced. All right, that was uh, good, but then, okay, I, I wasn't very happy with the setup, which was a little bit toyish. So I said, let's make real setup where we have real rocks I put there and then an object which is buried underneath those rocks and the robot needs to clear the, the, those rocks, move them away and then pick an object. And that was an epic failure. So it took forever. A robot was just exploring a lot because there are so, too many objects and uh, the input is just an image and the objects are unknown and um, it failed completely. So, and then I realized that it failed mostly because of the exploration issues in reinforcement learning and generalization issues. Like whenever you change a little bit the position of the rocks, it gets confused. It thinks this is the new situation and starts exploring again. So I looked at it and I said, we can solve this problem if we follow a different approach, which is uh, understanding the scene. So we can, the robot can look into these objects, can perform some kind of segmentation and then figure out which, where the objects are. And then as it's moving these objects, it's touching them, it can learn their mechanical properties like their friction and their, their, their mass. It can also learn their shapes, for example. And then if it, can, it has all that, then it can reconstruct in simulation a model of this environment, and then it can plan different rearrangement uh, motions to solve this problem. And that became the, my agenda, that became my guideline for my research at Rutgers, which is how can we, uh, how can a robot rebuild um, a simulated version of the world and play with it and learning it and, and do things on it. So we, can, we want to build the simulation of the environment uh, autonomously. So the robot needs to, to do that on its own without any supervision or without any human feedback. Um, 
And uh, this led me to this conclusion. So I learned from this experience that word models are, are very important. I'm putting here a quote from Jay Forrester, who is father of modern dynamic systems. And he says that uh, the image of the world around us, which we carry in our head, is just a model. Nobody in his head imagines all the world, government, or country. He has only selected concepts and relationships between them and uses those to represent the real system. So we always have this model or mental image of the world, and that's where we act, that's where we, we do everything, basically. And then we execute things in the real world. Now, this image of the world, we can get it from experience. So by interacting with the world, we can build the simulation, uh, and then we, we can select actions, and then we execute them on the real system. So then, the first, the, then the, okay, let's see how we can solve this problem uh, efficiently now, uh, because I'm very interested in uh, real applications, and I want to do things in... Uh, solve problems that are that we can sell to industry that we can um, that uh, that are time efficient and data efficient. So, um, for example, you have a scene of objects like this, and then you want to do something. You want to pick an object, for example. So, first thing you need to do is just from this input, you need to rebuild uh, 3D models of these objects, as you can see here. So, this is a work that we did uh, did with my student Chen Kyu Song, and then the input is a 2.5D image, and the output is completed shapes of of these objects. And uh, we need to do that to start reasoning about how to push the objects and how to manipulate them. Um, yes, yeah, so as you can see, the input is not perfect. It's just like this 2.5D, and then we want to reconstruct uh, all these models. Uh, one application for that is uh, searching for an object, for example, inside the drawer. Let's say you have an object, and then the robot will be playing with these objects, and then observing how they are moving. And then based on their motion, it can infer their shapes, and also based on their interaction with each other. So as these objects are colliding with each other, you can infer like there, there must be something below, or there must be something. So using physics reasoning can help you understand uh, the scene uh, better. Um, so this is an image from the experiments again. This is just a robot playing with objects and then observing, it's searching for something. And then it's observing how these objects are moving and based on their motions and also based on their physical interaction with each other, it can infer what, uh, what's beneath them, what's, what's there and what makes them stable, what makes them move in a certain way. So this is physics driven uh, uh, scene understanding. So this is the main pipeline, but um, it's, uh, as I said, uh, so, so, so the first line is just the, uh, uh, unsupervised segmentation, and then it's nothing new. And then some, what we have below is a new thing where we generate uh, different uh, hypotheses for each object that we see. Uh, we generate all sorts of hypotheses about the hidden shape, and then we'll be replaying in simulation uh, the actions that the robot executed uh, in addition to all the external forces such as gravity and uh, friction and interaction between the objects. And then at the end, we'll be scoring these shapes based on how realistic they are, how realistic the motions that they produce are. So if a uh, shape gives us a motion that is very close to, uh, I think there is a comment from somewhere. I don't know what it is, chat. Uh, what is RGBD 2.5D? 2.5D means that you only see the, you see 3D, but you only see the top surface. Okay, that's what 2.5D means. You, you don't see the, uh, there is like self occlusion. You don't see the bottom part of the object. 3D is full uh, 360 degrees. You can see the, the entire uh, scene. So uh, that was just a question. Uh, all right. Okay, sorry, and then I need to switch. So this is another view of this uh, thing, uh, where let's say we have a cup, we see it from a camera from a certain side, and there is all this hidden part that we don't see, uh, which is uh, occluded. And I like to call this the dark matter, because of the analogy with dark matter in the universe, uh, that we cannot see directly, but we can, uh, you know, dark matter in the universe. We don't see it, but we know that it's there based on its physical interaction with surrounding objects. Um, for example, gravitational lensing. In, in the same way here, we don't see the matter that we have behind this cup, but we can infer its existence uh, based on its interaction with the part that we see. Because if it's not there, then this object will, for example, fall. It will not be balanced. It cannot stand this way if there is no a missing part uh, that we don't see. So the, the goal here is to infer the, uh, this missing part of the object. And uh, so for example, here, this is something from the experiments. We, we see the top, uh, v, top part of the object, and then we try to generate all sorts of hypotheses by searching in this inf infinite space of possible shapes by doing transformations of the visible part. And that gives us a large set of hypotheses. Now the problem is how to select the right one. So the way we do it is we can be replaying in simulation all these hypotheses and see uh, on physics simulation and then do some rendering and then see which one matches the observation. Uh, I'm gonna move just to the equation, main equation here. This is Bayesian inference. So the X here denotes the uh, hypothesis that we don't see and we are trying to infer. 
and O here is the observations, and mu is the actions. So probability of the observation given, uh, sorry, the probability of the hypothesis given the observation and the actions is proportional to the likelihood of the observations times the prior. Um, and likelihood of the observation, we can get it from uh, render. We can just compute how far is the observation from reality. And then we have the prior, and the prior could be uniform, or it could be a prior that buys certain forms, or it could be a prior that you can get from deep neural network, for example, that gives you a, a spectrum of possibilities, and then you can fine tune it using this Bayesian inference. All right, now we want to do this not just for a single object, but we want to do it for an entire scene. So that becomes a huge challenge because what works for one object doesn't work for another object. You have to take into account all these interactions between the obje objects and the fact that they are colliding. They shouldn't uh, interpenetrate, for example. So you can build this graph of, uh, of uh, constraints between these objects and which object is constrained by which other object. And you want to assign now a shape for each one of these objects that is physically uh, realistic and also that satisfies the constraint with the uh, other objects around it. So this is constraint satisfaction problem that we solve using Monte Carlo to research. Um, just basically at each level, you will be selecting an object and you'll be assigning shape for it. And then you build a branch like this. And then at the end, you score the entire scene based on the realism of the, that scene in simulation and how close it is to the observation. And uh, you can repeat that. So there is nothing uh, really um, surprising here. Uh, so what's, what was present is the results. So the input, uh, this is the input that we have, just simple RGB image, uh, sorry, sorry, 2.5D uh, image. So it's, it's 3D image, but we only see one, only the top surface. And the output here is the, uh, the output of the algorithm. So this is the reconstructed uh, scene in simulation using single input here. So you just observe that and you can rebuild immediately this front view and this back view. This is what we return from the algorithm. As you can see, it's not uh, perfect locally. We can do a better job at uh, smoothing these surfaces. Uh, but what matters for me in robotics is the fact that this is uh, physically realistic. And this is, these objects are, as you can see, they are all balanced if you simulate them in these configurations. And um, they are not colliding with each, they're not going inside each other. And uh, we can then perform uh, all sorts of simulation uh, actions here, we can like imagine what would happen if I push this object, grasp this one, etc. So the robot can reason, this is just the first step. Now the robot can reason based on these models that we reconstructed in simulation. All right, I'm gonna, I think um, we have numerical results also where we compared uh, this approach with other uh, methods in computer vision, like a voxel method and uh, some other methods. And we, the comparison metrics are intersection over union, the F1 score, the precision and the recall. And uh, most of these metrics, we achieved the, the highest score using uh, this method. So we tried both using uniform prior and also using a size prior, which is prior that favors large objects over, uh, it gives a higher prior probability to larger volumes to over uh, smaller volumes. So that was the first part, which is reconstructing uh, the scene visually. But now, next thing that you want to do is infer the mechanical properties of these objects. Like, what is their friction between them? What is their mass? Because you need all that to be able to have accurate simulation of the, of the world. That is the second part of my talk, which is mass and friction identification, first using Bayesian optimization. And then I will show how to do this, the same thing, using differentiable physics. There was a chat. Uh, what does it say? What is the computational effort needed to do all this? Second, milliseconds, minutes, again, assume standard computation. Uh, have tried the symmetry prior? Uh, okay, good questions. So computational efforts, uh, it was in the order of seconds. Uh, I think uh, we reported the results in the paper, uh, but I think it was in the order of seconds, uh, maybe five seconds. And we are using just not a highly optimized or anything. We are focusing more on the uh, accuracy of the reconstruction here. Uh, let me see. Where is the, why am I, my mouse is doing strange things. It's hiding. Okay, now it's back. The Matthew asked, assuming uh, symmetry prior. Um, we didn't assume symmetry prior here, but we did uh, one, okay. So we have this continuous space of, uh, of shapes. Um, but they, we assumed that the hidden part share uh, similarities with the scene part. Uh, but the distance is not, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily symmetrical, but it has to have the same curvature. 
uh, that was also prior that we assumed there. Uh, but uh, symmetry prior, we didn't, uh, we didn't assume that they are symmetrical. Uh, but I think that could have been a good thing to add that like one of the models would be just symmetric and maybe most of the time it will have highest probability. But I think it's a general method where you can also plug in an output that you get from convolutional neural network uh, if it gives you distribution of, of possible shapes and you can use that as prior and then you can fine tune it using this Bayesian inference. All right. Okay, uh, so now let's talk about the inferring uh, mechanics of objects, which is a very cool thing, I think, also. So we did this uh, experiment where we have a, an object which is completely unknown, and the robot needs to pass this object to a second robot such that it can pick it from there. And, if the ob and the only thing we see there is a point cloud or an image of the object using the camera on the torso of the robot, as you can see there. And if you don't know anything about this object, then it's really challenging to choose very good velocity. So it's very easy to lose this object if you, if you push it. And again, this object is completely unknown. We don't know anything about it. Uh, so if you use a simulator and then you try certain pushing velocity, you execute it on the simulator and then you observe how the object is rolling and then you try the same thing on the real robot, it will behave differently. And this is what we call a reality gap. So simulators are always very far from reality and uh, they give you results that are different from reality. Now the goal of my research in every, all the following uh, parts that I'll be talking about is how to bridge this reality gap, how to make simulators as close as possible to reality from data. And this is another uh, motivation of this work. Uh, let's say you have this thin object that you want to grasp, but you cannot grasp it directly from the table because it's so small. So you need to slide it to the edge and rotate it in a certain way and then pick it from the edge of the table. And uh, if you don't know anything about this object, then you can easily drop it or knock it over and it will fall from the table. So you need to reason about the mass distribution, the friction of different parts of the object and in order to do that. Uh, and you can do that from data. So you can observe how the object is moving and then you can from there um, uh, infer its properties. So the goal of my research here is to bridge the gap between observed motions and, and simulations. So between real what happens to reality and what happens to simulation by using image that we get from reality. And we do that by identifying the, mass, the object's mass and friction parameters. Because if you know the mass and friction with the support surface, then you can pretty much uh, predict how the object is moving. So this is an overview of the approach. Uh, and this is how it works. So we have a controller that gives us a sequence of actions or controls. And then we can feed these actions to the real robot and also feed them at the same time to the simulation. Then we get from real robot a trajectory and we get from simulation another trajectory that can be different. We will observe the difference between simulation and reality. We can call this simulation error or reality gap. And then we'll be utilizing Bayesian optimization to tune the parameters mass and friction of of the objects that could be the robot. So this is a general framework. We can tune the parameters of anything you want there to make the uh, trajectories match basically or overlap at the end. And if you do that, then you bridge the reality gap from, from data, from observed trajectories. This is another view of the same uh, general approach. So I'm not gonna go into details. In most of this talk, I'm gonna just basically show the uh, high level view of the, of the research I did and the results. And, uh, but I'm not go, get, going to go into a lot of details of algorithms. So this is another view of the method. We have a policy search module that searches for a certain policy or strategy, and then it gives us policy, and then we feed the policy to a controller that gives us low-level actions, and we'll be executing these low-level actions on simulation and physical test bed. Uh, so real robot and simulated version of the robot and the environment. And then we get two trajectories, two onto a star. We'll be comparing them. This gives us certain error, and then we'll be applying Bayesian optimization to tune the parameters of simulation which are here mass and friction in order to reduce this reality gap. Once the reality gap becomes very small and maybe disappears, then we can switch this uh, simulator uh, output into the policy search. Uh, that means that we can count on the simulation to do search and to do control and to do everything we want. We can even learn there. So this is called like learning in dreams. Uh, if you have very accurate uh, simulation, that simulation can be seen as dreams of the robot. The robot is dreaming of things and you can learn inside those dreams or learn new behaviors or, uh, or plan if you, are, if you want to plan something, if you want to execute something. So let me show you just the results, sorry, of this method and you can see how it compares to model-free methods on the same experiment of uh, rolling object. Uh, is there a question or uh, maybe we, we do that and then, uh, yeah. 
So uh, first algorithm that they compared to was model-free reinforcement learning algorithm and model-free proceeds by trial and error. So it just tries different actions and then it learns uh, from the rewards that it gets. And as you can see, it's not autonomous. You need human assistance because we, uh, in reinforcement learning, we make mistakes and you need human to reset objects in the right position. And then it learns eventually what is the right velocity to push the object. So this is what you get if you use model-free reinforcement learning. So it's not really applicable in reality, in, in, in practice because you need human assistance. This is the method that we proposed. So the robot here, what it's doing, it's just playing with the object and observing how the object is moving. And based on the, the motions, based on the, the image that we are getting from the camera, we can use this Bayesian optimization technique to identify its mass and friction, search for the best mass and friction. Once we become certain enough, then we can choose the right velocity and then push it to the other end and the robot, the, 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 the other robot can grasp it. So this is this general approach that I'm following. We have objects that are now the robot plays with them in the same way a baby or a cat plays with the objects. And uh, we observe how they are moving. And as they, we, are, we are collecting these observations, we are uh, trying to identify why, what makes it move in the, this way uh, systematically. And then once we are certain enough, depending on the task that you want to do, then we can choose the right pushing velocity. So we did some comparisons with uh, model-free reinforcement learning algorithm like power and then model-based methods like PIRCO that don't use the same approach as what we, are, we described. Uh, that I described. And then we uh, report here, for example, the error in positioning the object at the end uh, based on the number of uh, data points that you need or number of trials that you need. And as you can see, this method is very data efficient, like over, after 15, uh, at just by playing with the object 15 times, you can uh, identify its parameters and then you can push it efficiently. But if you use the um, and you can see on the, the right side that we almost never drop the object because we, we are doing this safe exploration. We are just, when, when we explore the object, we use very low velocities and that's sufficient to identify what we need to know about the object. And then w once we are certain enough, then we can apply very high velocity to get it to the other uh, end. So in the next step, we, we wanted to do the same thing, but now with uh, more complex uh, setups. So we, this is co in collaboration with Costas, and this is a robot called Tensegrity. And this is a robot made by NASA. So Costas has a project with NASA, and they, they have built this robot. And the idea here is to drop this robot on some planet like Mars, and then make it explore there and collect data. Now, this is a robot made of compliant uh, soft parts that move. And the way this robot, so, so it's very safe for uh, exploration. It's, uh, you don't worry about it breaking or anything like that. Uh, but the problem, uh, so, and the way it moves is by moving these uh, cables, uh, or sorry, by shrinking the cables and expanding them. And by doing that, the center of inertia of the robot changes. Um, so this is very, I think, uh, cool and uh, minimalistic framework for, for uh, robotics. Uh, the only problem is that it's super high, it's super difficult to model. So it has, we have a simulator of this robot and that simulator has 288 parameters. And you need to identify these 288 parameters in order to simulate this robot accurately. Uh, and so some of these parameters are really difficult to uh, measure. Like for example, elasticity, friction, the, the, we cannot measure them uh, easily. And uh, these parameters are usually set manually by hand. And uh, one other problem is that the robot's properties or parameters can change over time. So for example, based on heat temperature, they can shrink or expand. They can, the terrain also can be different. Uh, there could be wind, there could, there, there could be so many things that can vary. So we cannot just fix a simulation and then assume that everything is gonna be working all the time the same way. So obviously one solution to solve this problem is to use, to infer the robot's model parameters from observed trajectories. So to have data-driven approach for uh, tuning this kind of simulation. Again, this is the same thing that I presented before. I'm gonna just present it again, general framework here, where we have a controller that gives us sequence of actions. We can feed them both to the real robot and to the simulation. We can get sequence of trajectories from real robot and from the simulation, and then we'll be comparing them, and this gives us some error. And then we'll be applying Bayesian optimization to identify all the parameters of the robot. And the output there is vector theta that contains, for example, the length, the, uh, the density, sorry, the friction of the motor, etc. for uh, 288 uh, parts of this, uh, or parameters of this robot. One big issue is time. So Bayesian optimization does not scale up well. It's exponential in the dimension of space that you are searching in. 
And here we have a huge space, 288 parameters, which is big for Bayesian optimization. It may sound little, but it's big to uh, search for the optimal parameters in this space. So we cannot apply directly that method. So I propose this solution. So if you look into these 288 parameters, you don't need to identify each one of them individually. Some of them maybe are not relevant. And also these parameters are not independent. They work together. So if you look into equations of physics, you have mass and friction. These, these terms, they appear inside the equations. They are all tied together. So you don't need to identify them individually. You just need to identify combinations of these parameters. Like, for example, mass and friction, if you are just pushing an object, then usually you care only about the product of the mass and friction. And uh, that gives you the motion of the object if you are doing very slow motion. So there are this, for example, product of mass and friction, maybe the sum of density and something else. So you have all these equations that tie these parameters together and that gives you the dynamics. So instead of searching in the original space, maybe you can learn a projection into a low dimensional manifold that preserves the dynamics of the system. So, so any, given any vector in 288 parameters, all the parameters of the robot, we learn a transformation into low dimensional uh, space, maybe 10 parameters, that gives us basically the sense of, this, uh, uh, of these parameters. And this uh, projection is gonna be uh, learned from data. And then once we figure out this projection, then we can perform a Bayesian optimization in this low dimensional space. We can be just searching and sampling or searching using uh, inside this low dimensional space, which is gonna be more time efficient. And then um, once we uh, do that, we, let's say we find now the optimal so parameters, set of parameters, then we can always project it back to the original space and uh, we can use it to simulate and to run it on simulator or, uh, predict or for controlling the robot or things like that. So we just learn a projection from the original space of the robot into compressed space, which is captures the um, uh, combinations of parameters or parameters that we care about. And then we learn also projection to the original space to execute on, to, to, to be able to simulate um, on real, uh, real physics simulator, the, the robot. So this projection has to be nonlinear because most of dynamics is nonlinear. We'll be using autoencoders and it has to be learned from data to preserve the dynamics of the robot. So it, it cannot be just in a projection, random projection. It should be a projection that keeps the information that we need about predicting how the robot is moving. Um, and I think, uh, I think maybe it's better to skip this part because I think it will not like the details using neural network. Um, so this is a demonstration of the identified model. Uh, we did it in simulation. We didn't have access to the robot at the end. Uh, hopefully we still want to run it. And this is the motion of the robot that we get after uh, identifying the parameters, we can control it to move from A to B in smooth and, and efficient way. Um, I don't know if people would be interested in that, but this is just to give you an idea of the different parameters that we are talking about here. So we have density, radius, uh, stiffness, damping, all these parameters, physical parameters, they have physical meanings. And then what we compared with different methods, uh, the error that we are making in identifying them. And then the last uh, column is the error that the method that we proposed makes. And on most of these parameters, it, gives, it gave us the smallest uh, error in, uh, in predicting these parameters. So, all right, let's move into maybe the last part of this talk, which is model identification using differentiable physics engines. And um, so this is the same problem that I want to solve, but I want to do it more efficiently. Uh, this is more recent work. And we are looking into using uh, differentiable physics simulations to achieve the same objective. So let me start with this video to motivate you about what I'm doing. So let's say you have this object, which is completely unknown. We don't know what it is and we want to grasp it. So we cannot grasp it directly from table because it's very difficult. It's, it's a little bit low and we need to push it to the edge and then pick it from there. Now, if you don't know anything about this uh, object, uh, which is the case here, then, uh, and you do this autonomously, which is what we are trying to do, then you may very easily choose positions where the object will drop. Um, and uh, so it's very important to know all these properties of the object before you can manipulate them carefully. And the idea here is to identify the mass distribution and friction coefficient of this object from data, and then utilize that to safely uh, push this object and rotate it and get it to the edge. So this is, uh, these are experiments that we have been doing for with different objects that we don't know, but we observe them, uh, the robot observes them and needs to learn or to model them uh, mechanically and geometrically. 
and build versions in simulation of them automatically. And uh, these objects, as you can see, they are not uniform. They have non-uniform mass distribution, non-uniform friction. Uh, some parts have higher friction than others. The, the distribution of mass is not even. And uh, we want to learn that from the observed motions. And we want to do this in principled way, obviously, in, in, uh, in, in data-driven way and um, using um, models of physics. So the first thing you do is you take this point cloud and then you uh, decompose it into qubits and then this is how we represent our objects as a finite set of a uh, grid basically or finite state a set of small qubits. Each one of these qubits is, uh, is, uh, is, is uniform in its own. It has a unique mass and, and friction coefficient, but then these qubits, they can be different. So they form the structure of the, of the object. So you can do that with different uh, objects. As you can see, you have just, uh, the, the, the input is just this point cloud. That's the only thing we see. That's the only input to the algorithm. And the output is this uh, uh, cube presentation. But then now what we need to do, and this is the, where the challenge is, we need to identify the mass and friction of each one of these cubits based on the motion of the object. And uh, this is the general approach now. So you uh, push the, ob the real object randomly. So with the real robot, you execute a push in action. And then you build a model in simulation of the object that you just pushed. And then you simulate the same action that you executed in the real robot, you, you execute it again in simulation. So what you'll be doing would be replaying everything that the robot did, it will replay it inside the simulation. And then observe the gap between what happened in simulation and what, what actually happened in reality. And this is what we can call simulation to reality gap or reality gap. And the idea now is to come up with algorithms that can minimize this reality gap by identifying or searching for the parameters that we don't know. And that's how we learn on the fly in real time. That's how we learn the, uh, maybe real time is a strong term, but on the fly, it takes a few seconds and then we can identify the, uh, the models of these objects. Let's see how we can do that. So we can use uh, Bayesian optimization again, but Bayesian optimization is very slow, as we said, it's not very efficient. So that's not gonna be the best tool to solve that, especially that we have a lot of small cuboids here, maybe hundred, and we need to identify for each one of them, uh, mass, inertia, and friction coefficient. So there are a lot of parameters to identify here, and uh, they are all interdependent because they all work together. So it's difficult to, to do, we cannot do that just separately. So let me, before presenting the, idea, the main idea, let me just uh, explain again how a physics engine works, traditional physics engine. So it has as input a, uh, an action that we execute, force, and then we have a state, which is position velocity. And we have also a bunch of physical parameters like mass and friction. We put them inside this physics simulation and we get the position at time t plus one or velocity at time t plus one. In differentiable physics engines, what you get in addition to that, you get also the gradient of the position or velocity at t plus one with respect to each one of the physics parameters, like with respect to friction, like how does velocity change? With respect to mass, how does the velocity change? You can get that from differentiable physics engine. And if you have that, then you can utilize that gradient to compute the gradient of reality gap with respect to all the, these physics parameters. So the gradient of the reality gap is nothing but the difference between the true state and the observed state and the predicted state squared. And you can compute the derivative of this loss or the, this reality simulation to reality gap. And then if you get from the physics engine, both the state and the gradient, then you can update. The, yes. 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 Uh, okay, somebody was asking a question, I think. No. All right. Uh, all right. Then there is. I'm sorry. I think Ahmed, you want to ask a question? Uh, no, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay. Don't know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. It's fine. Yeah. So then we get the gradient of reality gap and we can use that gradient to search doing gradient descent. We can search now for the optimal parameters of the, uh, of the object. The only problem is that there is no differentiable physics engine so far. I haven't seen one that is natively differentiable. Uh, all physics engine currently, they only provide you the next state. And there are some that gives you the gradient, but they do it numerically. So they do finite differences, which takes a lot of time. Uh, to do. So the gradient is computed just by doing finite differences approach. Well, that means that we have to develop our, for our own physics engine that is differentiable. And that's what we did. 
So we take, uh, we need to model uh, these push in actions. We have all these small objects that are tied together. We have the external forces, which are the pushing force by the robot. We have all these internal forces that tie, keep this object together. Basically, they, they link all these uh, sub parts together. So they are pushing, pulling actions. These are uh, forces that each part is applying on adjacent parts. And then we have all the external forces also like friction forces. These are friction forces we, between the object and the table. And you can see that these frictional forces, they depend on the velocity. So if the object is rotating, they will be going in opposite directions. And uh, they have also different magnitudes based on velocity. So it's, it's a whole system of forces are being applied on each one of these, uh, of these cuboids. Uh, then we model the entire thing as linear complementary problem, which is a uh, technique in optimization. But I think given um, I'm taking more time than I thought, and I'm going to skip that. But this is nothing but the uh, equations, so dynamic equations, so basically uh, uh, force, uh, the relation between forces and masses and accelerations. And then we have also constraints that keep the stru structure of the object together, that make sure that everything is moving in a rigid uh, object way, uh, rigidly. Uh, based on this system, we analytically derive the gradient of the loss with respect to the mass of each cuboid and with respect to the friction of each cuboid. Okay? So we have the derivative of the loss, uh, simulation to reality loss, and we got an analytical equation, which is kind of very long equation that has matrix inversions and things like that. Uh, but it's something that has closed form, so we can immediately get the gradient very fast, very quickly. We just need to invert the matrix, which, and the dimension of this matrix is the number of uh, uh, cuboids. So if you have like 100 sub-object, uh, you're going to have matrix which is 100 by 100, uh, which is diagonal matrix. So it's just inverting, uh, it's, not, it's not really about diagonal, no. Uh, it's just inverting this 100 by 100 matrix, which can be done very fast uh, these days. And then we, similarly, we got also a uh, closed form solution to the gradient of the loss with respect to friction of each subpart of the object. And I think that was really a nice result when we got that. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't obvious to do it, but then we got this analytical form. And then let me just show you directly how it works uh, in reality. So these are all the objects that we were pushing, as you have seen in the previous video with the robot. And then now I'm going to show you the steps of gradient descent. So we start with the initial model, which is pretty much uh, uh, uniform. We just don't know anything about this object. We start with just a uh, mean value somewhere. And then we start applying gradient descent by using the data points that we observed and computing analytically the gradient with respect to each one of these parts. And as you can see, as we keep applying this gradient descent, quickly we can converge to uh, something close to what we expect for this kind of objects. And what you are seeing here in this heat map is the mass of each part, um, like how heavy it is, uh, based on the data that we observed. Uh, red means high and blue means low. So it's interesting to see, for example, for the uh, toolbox on the top left part, uh, where we have uh, half of it um, contains metallic objects, so it's very heavy, and the other half is, is light, and the robot can infer automatically that just based on how the object is moving when we are pushing it. And uh, that's something difficult to do using other methods. Actually, in the experiments, the box was even closed, so we cannot even use vision for that because the, the box was entirely closed. We, we don't see what's inside it. The book is also an interesting example. This book is uh, open, so um, half of it is much heavier than the other half, and uh, we were able to infer also something close to that. Now, these are all um, qualitative evaluations, but how can we measure the, this numeric, uh, like qu quantitatively? The problem is that we don't have ground truth. We don't know the mass of each part of this, uh, uh, of this object. But what we can do is, and that's what the only thing that matters is, we can compare the results that we get in simulation using these models versus what we observe in reality. Okay, so we can, we, we have data that corresponds to how these objects move in reality when we are pushing them. And we can also simulate using these identified models, uh, how they move. And if the difference between the two is very small, then these are very good models that you can, uh, that reflect actually the objects. And that's what I'm showing in this slide here, where on the X dimension, we have the number of gradient descent steps. And on the Y dimension, it's simulation to reality gap, like how far is the simulation from reality? For, uh, for all these objects, this is the average. And as you can see that it, it takes very little steps of gradient descent uh, to get to the, uh, to get to the, to, to low error in centimeters. Uh, sorry, in meters, here it's in meters. So we are in uh, sub-centimeter error, uh, uh, two centimeters maybe, yeah. This is like more to, so we converge into something close to one centimeter at the end. So the unit on the Y dimension is meters. Um, 
and the x dimension is just the number of time steps that we do. So it's very time efficient, I uh, think. In terms of time, it's just the time, each step is the time to take to invert uh, matrix and uh, do some matrix multiplications. And what you can see here also is the uh, same thing with the, we have different curves for different training examples. Uh, like how many times did the robot need to push the object in order to learn its model? Uh, we, use, we are using, for example, at the beginning, only one push. With one push, you get certain error. And then if you do two pushes, you get a uh, smaller error. And then with five pushes, we kind of converge to uh, the maximum, uh, the, the smallest error we can have. So this is a comparison uh, for with different uh, model identification algorithms. So using, for example, a random search, using finite difference gradients, CMAC, yes. We also compared with uh, numerical differentiation using autograde, and uh, that's very slow. You, so Python has this autograde function that computes numerically the, the gradient. But if you have a large space and you want to compute the gradient by doing the finite difference idea, like plus delta minus delta and you divide by delta, that's uh, gonna be very slow because you have this uh, combinatorial combination of dimensions. Um, yeah, and these are just results with different algorithms. Um, so once you identify a model, you want to plan something, you want to do something with it. So let's say we figured out the model of this hammer. We need now to use that model to pick up the hammer. So given the initial configuration, we select the goal configuration uh, based on the model that we identified. And then uh, this goal configuration needs to be stable and uh, graspable. The object can be grasped from there. So the choice of the goal can be selected based on the identified model. And then we can utilize a planning algorithm like RRT, for example, or RRT star that gives us a path to the goal. Uh, and then we need to connect the, this gives us uh, like uh, waypoints to the goal. Now we need just to connect these waypoints. We need to figure out uh, pushing actions and forces at each point uh, to move the hammer from one, from one point, waypoint to the next one. And uh, this can be done also using the model that we built from data. And what we did also is local gradient descent on the contact point just to identify the optimal contact point. Like where should you press the, the hammer, for example, or the object that you are manipulating. And let me just show you now the final demo. So you have, uh, this is one of the experiments that we did. Uh, we have a completely unknown object and the robot wants to grasp it. And this is all done autonomously by the robot. So it first figures out the mass and friction using the gradient descent approach as it's pushing it. So the model is identified on the fly and uh, carefully selects target position. And what you see on the left side where the robot, the, the hammer fell is a case where we don't do model identification, where we just assume uniform mass distribution. We are not doing this uh, kind of careful reasoning about the mass distribution. On the right side is the algorithm that we proposed. And it's, uh, it's as you can see, it, it carefully plans the configuration based on the model that it learned. And it also picks it and puts it and succeeds in solving the task. So I repeated these experiments with various, this actually, some people say that this, this, this acts like uh, cats doing that. Anyway, so I hope my, my robot is doing a little bit better than, than cat in, the, in that aspect. Um, so these are the results. We, we have on the success rate of different methods. The, uh, the method using uh, uniform mass distribution achieves uh, something like 75% chance of, sex, of picking the object. That's because by chance, sometimes the object doesn't fall. It just falls 25% of the time. And then uh, the red one is using the method that uh, I presented. Uh, here and the green one is using that one, the same method, but without putting upper bounds. Um, I think uh, I kind of explained everything much slower, but I'm going to perhaps skip the rest just for interest of time and go to some just uh, quick videos of the other things I, I, I wasn't able to explain. So this is a collaboration with Meridol where we, Meridol built, uh, uh, my colleague Meridol built this robot uh, by himself and he designed every part of it. And uh, all this robot is made of uh, 3D printed pieces. And uh, it's a robot that it's, it's difficult to have model for it because it's a low cost robot. And uh, we apply the same principles of differentiable physics here to identify the friction of each wheel with respect to the ground and use from data and then use those, those friction parameters to plan how to uh, control this robot to perform, for example, an eight shape, eight figure or circle. Um, so there is another uh, body of work that I did here few, last few years, but I wasn't able to present it obviously because of time. And this is uh, learning models of underactuated hands. So this is with the uh, postdoc Avishai uh, Sentov. 
uh, who is now an assistant professor. The, uh, the, what we did there is we built this uh, 3D printed, uh, these hands using 3D printed components. And then um, these are very compliant hands, underactuated. They are soft, they are made of soft materials. So they are very good for adapting uh, to obstacles and uh, they are safe to use with humans. So you don't worry if they collide with human. The only issue is that they are very difficult to model because they have uh, so many components that are not rigid. Uh, so what we used is uh, data-driven methods to learn their dynamics, and this is one idea that we uh, we proposed a lot of methods for learning the dynamics of these kind of hands and then controlling them based on these models. So uh, typically what you would have is the state of the hand at a given time, and then you have also the action that you want to apply, which is the actuator's uh, forces or loads. And then you have a neural network that predicts where the fingers are going to be at the next time step. And here's an idea that I proposed, which is uh, in addition to learning to predict this theta time t plus one, we went also to, to predict uh, where does the neural network makes errors. So we want to have another model, which is kind of a coach or a supervisor that looks into the neural network and tells us where does it make more errors. Uh, like, is it, should we trust what the neural network is giving us or not at given uh, in a, a every different state? And that's because neural networks, they are able to track the dynamics very well in certain regions, but then there are certain regions where we cannot really trust them, so we should avoid those regions. And then once you build this kind of models, then you can utilize that to physically plan how to go from start state to goal state. You can build this kind of trees, and then you select sequence of moves to get to your goal state, and you can perform uh, different in-hand manipulation tasks using that. So another thing I looked into using with my student, Liam Shram, is transfer learning. So given, uh, let's say you learned already the model of the hand, and then you want to you build a new hand. And uh, you don't want to re recollect data with the new hand and you know, it takes a lot of time and efforts to do that. So we want just to learn how to transfer the model that we learned for the original hand uh, into the new hand uh, with minimal effort. And that, that, there was an algorithm that we proposed with Liam that, worked on solving the, uh, that works on solving exactly this problem. It can efficiently transfer between hands uh, dynamics models. <clears throat> Okay, so last thing is this part, which is uh, related to six deposit estimation. That's uh, also another body of work that I did with uh, my student Chen Kyo, uh, sorry, uh, Chaitanya Mitash, who, is, who was co-advised with Kostas Bakris, and he graduated now. And the, um, the, the idea here is uh, estimating the pose of an object in space. So let's say you have 3D model of an object, you have all the shape of the object, and you have a scene, and now you want to know where this object fits inside the scene. So you want to know the uh, position, X, Y, Z, and rotation or orientation of the object in, in space. And the robot needs to know that in order to pick it, for example. Uh, this, this is known as six deposit estimation. So it's, it's mostly computational uh, issue. Uh, a lot of, it takes a lot of time to do that. So we need to come up with computationally efficient algorithms, which is what we did. So I'm gonna just show you the algorithm, the output here. So the input is a densely packed scene with a lot of objects and it's very confusing here because we have so many objects that look similar. We don't know where they are in space, etc. And the problem is figuring out where each, uh, each one is. And um, uh, the output is what you see on the right side, where we fit a model into each one of these objects. So this is called 6D pose estimation. And again, the principle here is always using uh, physics to drive whatever hypothesis we're making about the environment or about the objects. So whenever we come up with uh, poses, we want to verify in simulation that they are realistic, they are consistent, they are uh, stable, and then uh, and they also match the observation and then use that to drive our uh, reasoning about uh, where the objects are in space. So it has been always the same principle that they have been using, do perception or model identification, but do it in a way that is physically realistic, physically consistent. So whichever answers you come up with, you should be able to simulate them and, uh, and simulation should be accurate. Okay, then this is just a demo of this work. Uh, as you can see in real, almost real time, it's not really real time, but there is like one second delay maybe, where we have uh, inputs which are point clouds and the output is how the algorithm is fitting these models, uh, these 3D models inside the, this point cloud. Um, and uh, so, yeah, we had, we had a lot of algorithms for that and the student graduated recently. And I think for certain data, set, data sets, we, we still have the, the uh, state of art performance uh, for certain public data sets.
Uh, this, I will finish with a few applications of uh, the, that uh, the, the, this work. So uh, on the left side is one project that we did with uh, JJ and uh, Costas about uh, bean packing. So we have a bean where we have a lot of objects and the robot is tasked with picking them and then putting them in a very nice uh, order in, in, uh, in a box. And this is a project that was done, uh, funded by JD.com, company in China. And uh, I think there are startups that are doing that and that are valued at tens of millions of dollars. But we did that with uh, our students here at Rutgers and uh, I think it worked quite well. And on the right side, we have uh, also same thing, uh, bean packing, but we want to do rearrangement. This is something I did with uh, Chang Kyo Song, my student, and we were able to uh, come up with the efficient strategy for planning how to uh, align the objects without having to push each one of them individually, but you can utilize non prehensile pushing actions to align the, the, the bean. Um, I think, okay, I will finish with, since it has been almost an hour now, just last minute, I'll finish my, with my future work, things that I think I would be working on. Uh, so the first point is doing multi-scale differentiable physics engines. So, uh, so far the physics models that I presented, they are uh, kind of homogeneous everywhere. So they try to, uh, to model the dynamics uh, uh, at the same level of resolution everywhere. But we want to do something multi-scale where in regions where you, you, the robot is interacting, where there is contact, then you need to have very accurate physics. But everywhere else, you can have just a vague model that could be enough for uh, reasoning. Uh, so you don't have to use the same kind of resolution for every part of the scene. So how can we do this automatically and what kind of structures we'll be using for that? That'll be interesting to explore. The second point is hybrid analytical statistical models. And the idea here is to combine uh, these physics models that use the physics equations with uh, neural networks. And uh, I think uh, Dimitri has some work on that on combining um, differential equations with neural networks. Uh, that's something that would be interesting to look into. Like, how do they integrate? Like, these are, these are two different ways of thinking about this problem. One utilizes all the knowledge that we have in physics, and the other one is basically completely data-driven and physics agnostic. And um, so there should be some way of getting the best of two worlds. Uh, third point is end-to-end -to -end integration of differentiable physics engines with differentiable 3D renders. So three, differentiable 3D renders, they gives you the derivative of a pixel in an image with respect to the pose of an object. Differentiable physics gives you derivative of the pose with respect to force. If you integrate the two, then you can get the derivative of a pixel with respect to forces that you are applying. And that would be very interesting. Then you can do both shape reconstruction and uh, uh, parameter estimation, friction and mass, uh, using the same uh, platform in end-to-end -end way. And then the last point is relation to intuitive physics, which is, I think, a very interesting question. So humans, they don't need to use this kind of precise quantitative reasoning about the world in order to perform most tasks. We, we use kind of a hybrid of the two things. We, sometimes we use this uh, reason about forces and sometimes we just do things logically in the sense that we, we use logic reasoning or symbolic reasoning. And uh, it would be interesting to see how these two end of spectrums uh, fit together and if we can come up with an approach that unifies these two ways of reasoning. All right, thank you very much. I want to thank these people, obviously. Who have been involved in this work, I almost forgot. So these are my students, postdoc Avishai and Kostas, who has been a close collaborator on, on uh, works that I have been doing. So thanks, Abdeslam. We have some time for some more questions. Um, Abdeslam, I have a yes. question. A uh, very nice yeah. talk. I really Thank you. Really impressive work. Um, my question, I think it relates to your number four of future work. Do you have um, thoughts on how object recognition might fit in? Like I, I, I see that this is a hammer and I know in the past hammer has a heavy head and, and a light handle, you know, do you yeah. have thoughts on yeah. how to integrate that? Yeah, so actually it's, it's, yeah, it's interesting that you ask this question. This was a this was pro project I have been exploring this summer with students, which is uh, uh, next time you see a hammer or a new hammer, uh, you don't want to identify everything from scratch, obviously, because you have already experienced with similar objects. So how can you learn? Uh, and we, uh, So the project that I was doing this summer is using deep neural network, convolutional neural network, that takes as an input an image and outputs this heat map that tells us the physical properties of this object like where is the mass and everything like that. And then we can train that model from uh, data. So as we gather more, 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 more examples, we can learn train neural network that takes an image and outputs the uh, physical properties or the mass distribution of the object. 
And, uh, and then you can utilize that as prior to this kind of fine uh, tuning uh, method that I presented. So you can use that as initial seed maybe. Um, well, and then after you touch the object, maybe you'll figure out that it's different. I think we all had the experience of lifting a, a bag that was empty, like suitcase that uh, was empty. So we have this mental uh, image that it's heavy, it has stuff, and then we plan based on it, we apply too much uh, force for lifting it, and then we adapt quickly on the fly to the change in the, the mass, the fact that it's empty, and then we adjust our... Uh, so I think the same kind of reason is we can use experience to learn prior models using neural networks, and then we use this kind of physics reasoning uh, to do fine-tuning on, on the fly on, with real objects as we are interacting with them. Great, thank you. Thank you, David. Abdeslam, uh, yeah. you're talking a lot about models and, and physics. Um, as we know, there is a big part of the community, especially on the West Coast, Berkeley, and so on, that have pushed a lot the direction of end-to-end -end, um, learning for, for manipulation. They're attracting a lot of attention from the media, a lot of uh, funding. And, you know, uh, Sergey Levin said, you know, you don't really need to learn physics. Uh, this is quickly, whatever you have to learn, you can learn directly from data, and you do not have to kind of explicitly encoded. So why should we be doing this work on uh, modeling and uh, physics? Well, so the way I see the, the, the their work, so what I is saying is that there are these methods that don't need to, uh, they, don't, they don't want to reason about physics, they can learn directly how objects move from uh, images using deep neural network. And uh, so far, there have been like very toyish examples of that, basically just push, push an object from a few centimeters away and they haven't seen like tasks as, as careful as uh, with very little data, pushing a hammer and then picking it or doing more realistic things. But um, so the way, see it, the way it fits in the big picture that you put here is you can use all those methods as prior and uh, it, it's fine. You can, of course, I think this is how humans reason. They don't have to touch objects to know their mass or they can just from experience, we have this deep neural network that tells us all their properties, uh, categories and things like that. So we can utilize that, uh, whatever they get as an input as prior. Uh, but then um, as we are touching the objects or manipulate them, we need to figure out the, we need to do some kind of physics reasoning and then uh, from there identify their models. Now, what kind of physics reasoning we need to do, to do uh, in the future? I think that's also an open question. I'm not sure if we need to use equations of physics or we, there may be other methods to do that that are simpler, but that's the only way you know how to solve this problem so far. Um, and the other, I think, part of the answer, so that's first part, we can use those methods as prior and then we can fine tune things uh, on, on the fly uh, using real uh, physics simulations. And I think in industry, that's what people like to, to do. They, they wouldn't trust, for example, let's take autonomous car and you have a model of how things move, but then you don't want to trust directly the output of a neural network that tells you that this car is going to turn left. If you see it turning left, then it's turning left. So, so you need to adjust to with little data to what you are seeing in front of you as you are acting in the real world. Uh, second part to this uh, uh, question, answer to this question is maybe in the long, time, long term, if we have a lot of data and we have a lot of robots learning and sharing their experience on the cloud, then yeah, maybe in the same way humans evolved through millions of years and sharing all the experience, then uh, we evolved into uh, not uh, having to evolved into having these intuitive models of physics, maybe our robots will be able to use just neural networks to do that. But uh, the, the whole problem here is data efficiency. So if we, if we let robots learn maybe for years and they be sharing on the cloud all their information about all objects, then uh, maybe we don't need to, we can have neural networks that are very efficient for that. Okay, thanks. So, so and you see that there are basically challenges that uh, it's not possible to do in the end-to-end -end, uh, way and you yeah. can attract attention by, by showing, by emphasizing these problems that require the, the physics. Exactly. I think at the, the uh, current time where we are and uh, it's not yet applicable, but I wouldn't say in the future it's not going to convert to doing these end-to-end -end methods, but I, I always see it as uh, a prior uh, and then you need other methods to fine-tune that prior with very little data, like just one instance, and then you want to change your belief about what's happening uh, or what kind of object is that, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Costas.
So uh, I'm just curious about the kind of limits of differentiable physics, like um, sort of things like collisions involve discontinuities sort of in trajectories and um, interactions. Um, yeah, so if we, the, the experiments that we did here is without, uh, the only collision that we have is between the Andy factor and the object. And uh, we even assume that the contact point, as we are simulating, is constant uh, touching single cell. Uh, but the, and then the uh, velocity and force is different parameters. But if you want to have contact with other objects, uh, it becomes more difficult to model. But I don't think, um, I think there are ways, to, we have points of the, the points where the system is not differentiable, but these are just single points that I think we can, um, we can avoid maybe, we, we can avoid computing the gradients at those points perhaps. We can use subgradients maybe in the different regions and we don't have to differentiate at those points of, of contact. But I agree that the uh, contacts are really uh, difficult to, uh, for these kind of methods. We, we haven't yet thought of if there is a collision between two objects as we are pushing one, how we use this framework. So this framework assumes that uh, the object is collision free. And uh, if there is contact, I agree. But um, let me think more about that, how to solve this problem. So if there is a certain contact, uh, yeah, you will have like two regimes, when, uh, when you are moving before uh, collision and then after collision. And then even the point of collision will be variable. Um, yeah, so I agree that it can be very, very difficult. That's, that's a good point. I think Bill is asking a question or? It doesn't, doesn't look like it. He's okay, just, just muted. Mike. Yeah. So some other questions, anything about, I went too fast, I know that, but <laughs> just so difficult to present. Uh, just, I, and I didn't go deep into techniques, I just presented a basic overview of the uh, methods. Uh, Uh, I think that uh, that was great. I think you can uh, stop the recording, uh, um, and we'll we'll thank you one last time uh, and uh, invite people to talk with you uh, offline. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. So I will stay here if anybody has any questions to ask me. Uh, but uh, thank you very much, everyone, for attending the thank talk. You. Thank you, Lee. By the way, I'm always impressed if I see somebody who manages to get NSF funded toothpaste. <laughs> toothpaste. Uh, yeah, well, toothpaste is also important. <laughs> Good job. Thank you.